everybody. Welcome to today's program. I'm just stalling for a second while we get logged in. Um, just going to watch those numbers go up for a second, and then I will get us going. All righty. Okay. We're doing well. All right. Well, everybody, welcome to today's webinar. Um, as always, if you are one of our regular attendees, welcome back. We're so glad that you are here. If you are new to today's program, I'm going to share a few notes for you that should be helpful. Um, first of all, this is a Zoom webinar. It's a little bit different than a Zoom meeting since we can't see your face uh, or hear you. When you have questions during this class, you'll look at your Zoom menu. There's a Q&A button. You'll hit that button and type any questions you have into that menu. I'll be monitoring that and I can give questions to Peg as she's ready to take questions. We are recording today. We also have class notes from Peg. I just received those uh, this morning. And so we'll be sending those out to you all tomorrow along with our class coupon. Um, and so just you can look forward to that. It has the names of the plants and all that kind of useful information. Uh, I'm trying to, I feel like I'm forgetting something here, Peg. <laughs> if well, we don't get to any, oh, sorry. <laughs> Were you going to say something? I think you pretty much covered it. I really wanted them to know that they will be getting this with the plant names yes. on it and, and have the opportunity to look back, right? Because they get the videos, right? Yes. Yes. They can coordinate. That's very okay. helpful. Perfect. All righty. Um, so that's about it for us on that side of things. Just if you need anything during the class, please feel free to ask me and just be aware that we do have a recording and a plant list for you. Um, all right. Well, I know Peg really needs no introduction. <laughs> Peg has been with the store for many years. Uh, she designs beautiful containers, has a beautiful garden of her own and draws her inspiration from, from all of her experience. Um, she's been teaching classes with us for many years, she was on our Maryfield Gardening Advisor TV show, which we were actually just chatting about before we uh, we logged on. Um, and so she's a great instructor of ours. So Peg, I'll go ahead and, and turn it over to you so you can get started. Thank you very much, Sally. And yes, she's here still because she's doing what she loves, okay? Loving all of the environment and the plants and all of you people, okay? And I have done Zooms on winter in the garden and spring in the garden. And now today we're going to concentrate on summer in the garden. And I'm going to highlight a lot of those plants that I've grown myself and some here at the garden center also in our designer gardens out front and to share with you some of the care that's required for some of these. But if we bring up the very first picture, what what I would like to do is Bren came out and, and took some pictures, et cetera, in the garden, which I use for uh, showing people how I put things together. And I was sitting beside the little water garden uh, with the fish. So I, I want to emphasize that whatever you do in your garden, be sure that it's something that you will enjoy and your family and your friends that you can be out in this garden and sit down every now and then and smell the roses. Well, I don't think there were roses in that arrangement. We'll start with the fact that having a garden and having those flowers, and I had done that arrangement, which Bryn was filming, and that's part of the pleasure of a garden is being able to include some of those things that you can pick and bring into your home so that you can enjoy the garden indoors as well as out. And in the very next picture, this is not of my garden, but I thought it was a good example of how you can have a lot of things in a small space. This person was a master gardener for sure, and she needed some privacy. She had a fairly large space, but, but not huge. And so she used deciduous trees, those that lose their leaves, as well as some evergreens as the background for this. And those trees got morning sun and then afternoon sun. But the front part of this garden got full afternoon sun. And so she was able to grow 
a lot of those plants that required uh, a lot of sun. And you can see some ornamental grasses in there. There are a lot of different perennials in there. And so this is a space, this is how you can use a space perhaps as a privacy border. And I thought it was important to give some thoughts as to, okay, where can I use these plants? I love these plants. I want some perennials, but I want to mix them with some shrubs and other things that have structure and through all seasons of the year. So let's go to the next one. This particular one was taken in the front garden. You can see it's beside the road there. You can see the, the cars going down the road. And it is absolutely full sun. And I quickly did this planting a couple of years ago. And so last year when this picture was taken was its first full year of being in the ground. And the background situation there is hydrangea. This is hydrangea little lime. There's a lot of confusion about hydrangeas. Do you prune? Not. Why isn't my hydrangea blooming? Thank goodness all of my mop head hydrangeas, which is microphylla, did not get frosted this year because sometimes we have a late frost and hopefully we won't but it has had some time to harden off with the fresh new leaves. So hopefully I'm going to have an abundance of flowers on my mop head. But this is paniculata and it can be pruned somewhat. I don't prune mine heavily. And now you can go out and if there's any dead wood in it, you can go ahead and flip that out. But that this particular type blooms on current season's growth okay, or out of last year's growth. In front of that, the blue tall one, fringy one in the center is a perennial called Porovskia. Porovskia. And the bright yellow blossoms that you see there are fantastic. They are quasi-perennial. It is Rudbeckia herta. Rudbeck, there's many different types of Rudbeckia. And this one is marginal. Most of the time it comes back in my garden, but the beauty of it is it does seed about somewhat, not obnoxiously. I never can, I love seeding with some things, okay? Particularly if those, those things that I really like and they're not difficult to pull up or eradicate the extras. You will also see some grasses. Um, they don't, they're just airy at the moment, but in the fall, they're absolutely magnificent. And it's Mullenbergia, Mullenbergia, okay? I, did I say that that hydrangea is little lime? Okay, good. I needed to do that. And you can just barely see a little purple between some of those large daisy blossoms. And that is an allium, but it is a bulb that blooms in the summertime. And it really is a, a wonderful, wonderful little allium. I like it. And there's several different varieties on the market now. And so choose the one that you like best. In the background of this, you can just see Another marvelous, could be a tr small tree. Most of the time we prune it back heavy because the blooms come on this year's growth. And I really do enjoy that particular plant. It's it's blanked out of my head at the moment. <laughs> okay, let me see if, if I put that down here. Oh, it's Vitex, V-I-T-E-X. Sorry about that. Every now and then that happens. Let's go to the next one, honey. All right. This is my own garden and it's actually late spring, early summer perhaps. You can see that the pansies are still hanging in there. I probably took those out shortly after this picture was taken, but I wanted you to see also the allium. We talked about the little allium that blooms in the summertime. These are the tall, big alliums that bloom in late spring, early summer, and they really put on quite a show. And actually when their intense color is gone, 
they look fragile and they're not. They really do put on quite a show. And I had planted kale, which went all through the winter. And that is the yellow that you see in bloom there. There's in the, in the background of this picture, you can see some spiky little plants. And that is a variegated iris, which does have a bloom, but I don't grow it for the bloom. I grow it for the, the plant itself and the color within the plant and the change, the contrast that those spiky leaves give to the rounded leaves of, uh, actually it's a hardy geranium that's not in bloom there, and of the boxwood that is also there. Okay. Peg, in the last photo, were there any plants, I didn't see them, with dark red flowers? Oh, there are, and it is a cone flower. Yes. Cone flower? Okay. In, in the distance, over where you see the car. But I am. Yes. Yep. To, those are the ones. Yeah. I, I believe okay. that I do have a closer picture of that one coming up. Okay. So we'll we'll concentrate on that a little bit. All right. This is later, and here you have the early spring things. The pansies are gone. You've got a pink cone flower in the center that is absolutely wonderful. And behind that, the taller one is a summer phlox. And I do enjoy the summer phlox because they bloom for a very long time, particularly if you deadhead carefully some of the old blossoms. But this one is a newer variety to me. It's called Gina, J-E-N-A. And the birds, beasts, and butterflies absolutely love it. Now, I have one that does seed prolifically and I started many years ago the Queen Anne's Lace in my garden, and I absolutely love it. I love it in uh, arrangements and in the garden also, but one does definitely have to get rid of some of the excess of that, you know, so you don't want that unless you're willing to pull up some of it, okay? And the all green, very ferny looking plant is an Amsonia hubrecti, and it does bloom in the spring, but its fall color is what's so important. You can see there's still some kale hanging in there. Amazingly, that kale lived all through the summer. I was surprised about that. And then coming on later, the green in the foreground is a Nippon daisy, which won't bloom until the fall. But the beauty of having a garden is trying to include some of those things that will bloom or be interesting throughout the seasons. And this is my front garden. There's a porch there where I can sit on and, and watch the birds, bees, and butterflies, particularly the hummingbirds, because they're so interesting. Part of the big display from trees, because there are not a lot of trees that uh, are blooming in the summertime, but one that stands out is the crepe myrtle, okay? And I do have those in the background. Finished up blooming is a French tree, Cheonanthus, and the on the far on my far right is the um, Sweet Bay Magnolia, which blooms usually early summer. Okay, and is incredibly fragrant. The French tree is fragrant. Also, we have color pickup at the base of that uh, Bay Magnolia. That is a variegated. Um, the variegation picks up some color there, and it's an abelia. And then there's a wall there, and above the wall, there are several hydrangeas. The hydrangea little lime, but you can't see it from here, but there's also the mop head hydrangea, okay? And uh, there's a lot going on here, and within that bed, there are a number of perennials also. So you can see, even in a small space, you can have an awful lot going on. This is a, a border that I created um, because it was a very steep bank and did not want to mow that, and you wanted, but you wanted to keep erosion down because there's a creek at the bottom of this. And so it was planted primarily for the birds, bees, and butterflies, for their nesting, 
for their uh, pollen, for a lot of different things, okay? And I've done a lot of seeding into this area. This is the, the daisy type flower that you see there is that Rebecca herta, which as I said, is not totally perennial, but it does drop its seeds and you see some variation there because sometimes when things seed in, they don't come totally true. And I really have enjoyed that. And of course the birds, bees and butterflies enjoy it also. The tall plant, yellow plant is yarrow, which blooms for a long period of time and picked in its prime dries beautifully. And in the front of that little border are a lot of petunias. Again, and particularly as I'm looking at it on my left, there's the tall Verbena bonariensis. These are all long blooming plants, great for the pollinators, and um, even in small spaces can be very useful. In that same border, in the front are lavender plants, different types of lavender, okay? And Asclepius is the bright orange there, butterfly weed. This is my absolute favorite butterfly weed. I love the color, stays in bloom for a long, long time. And, and of course the caterpillars thrive on that, the monarchs, okay? I love to introduce gray into the garden wherever I can because it complements everything. And this one is a perennial also, and it's called Sandalina. All right, let's talk quickly about lavender. Everybody seems to love lavender. I certainly do. Lavender has some absolute requirements. One is it wants sunshine. Where that is located, it gets six or seven of absolute direct sun during the day, which is all it needs. What it really needs is excellent drainage. So you don't want to take this plant home and plant it in a solid plate that is not going to drain, okay? It's planted at the top of that hill, and if it's not a hill, mound it up. Work in uh, some pea gravel or some small gravel and plenty of compost to break up the clay. Plant it high. Don't mulch heavily around it and don't do overhead watering if possible, okay? So drainage is the key for growing this plant. I absolutely cannot be without lavender. Okay, let's do the next slide, see what's coming next, okay? Uh, this is another, oh, I had to show. I, you can tell I absolutely love this butterfly weed, Asclepius, okay? And behind that are some tall petunias. Those particular petunias happen to be seed that I've saved from my mother's garden. So those seeds have come down through, as a little child, I remember those same petunias. And in the front, another great one to add. And this is actually growing in the edge of my driveway, which is a gravel driveway, all permeable. The water soaks into everything, but it drains really well. And that's why this Asclepius is really happy there. And also the um, alyssum that is behind that gives you great summer bloom. And there's some new alyssum on the market now that really will even go through the, the summer heat. They're proven winter. And so look for, there's a couple of new varieties out there really does well. This particular area gets afternoon sun for about five or six hours, but amazingly that Asclepius is really doing well. And by the way, it is Asclepius tuberosa. And that's important because it, there are a lot of tall, rather spindly, but still valuable Asclepius on the market. But this one is low growing, very bushy. And it does, by the way, set seeds. When the seeds form, they're very interesting and the children love to go out and just blow them all around. And I love for them to do that because then I get all those babies. 
Another one, great for the birds, bees, and butterflies, but very colorful going into late summer and into uh, even into the fall. It, the tall one in the back is Joe Pie Weed, another great one for the garden, but it is tall. Now, with a plant like Joe Pie Weed, you can, when it is a foot or so tall, pinch out the tippy tops and it will send out shoots from the side and keep it from being so tall. You can't do that with everything, but you can do it with a lot of things. In front of that is an ornamental grass. Now, let me tell you a little story about ornamental grass. This one was planted a long time ago, or some of them were planted a long time ago, when they were the greatest thing since sliced bread, like the calorie pear, Bradford pear. Some of those big, tall grasses seed about pretty badly, and I don't like them because they're difficult to get up. Some of the miscanthus are fine because they grow beautifully and they present motion in the garden as well as a lot of other interests. The variegated ones, cabaret, cosmopolitan, I've never had those seed. And Miscanthus gracilimus, which was the original Miscanthus, has never seeded about well for me either. So those are the ones that I go for when I want that big grass that is a wonderful contrast to all of the other plants that are with it. And in front of that is a white summer phlox. You can also see uh, some of the ones that begin to bloom in the late summer, going into fall, which I call my H plants. Helianthemum, Helianthus, Heliopsis. They are all fantastic and I, I love them very much. And in the next picture, okay. I love to cut my flowers and bring them in to the house to enjoy. And I love to support all of our pollinators and, and the environment. And I often go for annuals because annuals are different than perennials. They will bloom all season, whereas the perennials have a period of bloom. So annuals are great when they are mixed into the border with your perennials or with your shrubs. The solid purple that you see is the globe um, amaranth. No, not amaranth. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not coming up with that properly. Okay. I've got it written down here now. <laughs> Gumfrina. Okay. Gumfrina. Gumfrina. For, there's several different varieties of this, and the gumfrina is a tight little blossom that feels almost artificial and is picked and used in arrangements, but dries perfectly. So it's great for dried flower arrangements also. And in the foreground are salvia. There are a lot of different salvia out there, and all of them are, there's a purple one. You can also see some red salvia there. Wonderful, wonderful pollinator plants. And the hummingbirds absolutely love a garden like this, okay? Look for some that are really tall, really big. They go two and a half to three feet. And it's called the Rockin' Series. Really a lot of fun with those plants, but you have to have some room for them. So having annuals mixed in with your perennials and your shrubs is, is a big advantage. Now in the next picture, you're going to see a close up of that summer phlox. This one, sometimes you can get some powdery mildew on phlox and I don't worry too much about it. I just cut it back and, and move on and, and it'll come back out. But this summer phlox is Gina, J-E-N-A. So the, the blossoms are smaller but there are a lot of clusters and it is fantastic, okay? Going on to this one, I should have had this picture right behind the other miscanthus, this fronted by the Joe Pie weed, but in the background is the variegated uh, miscanthus and that is either cosmopolitan. Um, I think pre pretty sure that that's cosmopolitan in that particular picture, okay? but it could also be one called cabaret, okay? 
and in the next one. Okay, this is another border that I have in the garden. This gets absolute full morning sun. And then there's some shaded in the afternoon, but it's dappled light all through the afternoon. In this area, there is a background of camellias because I absolutely love camellias, particularly the ones that bloom in the fall, the camellia sesangua. And when they finish blooming, that beautiful glossy leaf carries all year long. So it's a great background for this type of planting. There's a lot mixed in here. There are some mop head hydrangeas in here. There are um, a lot of bulbs that are here you're not seeing because they're finished and the foliage has died back and you have to let that foliage die back. Those of you that have that in your garden right now, don't go out and cut it off until it turns brown. But these perennials come up around those bulbs and hide that foliage to some degree to make it acceptable, okay? There are iris. You can see the, the, the strong upright leaves here. They will bloom, but I enjoy the foliage of that also. There's the pink coneflower. There are daylilies that are not yet in bloom, but will be. In front of that, there's petunias, which I let get kind of leggy because they just intertwine with all the other things. There are a lot of salvia, which you're not seeing too obviously in this picture. But here again, wonderful things for the pollinators. There's also a lot of a still be. Their soils are different in our gardens. I have some areas that stay pretty moist and some that don't, okay? And where a still be can be in soil that stays slightly moist, it really thrives. And again, blooms for a long period of time. And I leave the blossoms up even after they're finished with their prime, because even in their brown state, they are interesting. There's also, which you don't see in this picture, several um, clematis or clematis as you wish. And I do have pictures following this, different types. I love the little bell-shaped ones. And this one, this one really has a, a difficult name. And I'm going to spell it R-O-O-G-U-C-H-I, Raguchi. But there are other varieties also. This blooms for a long period of time. In the next picture is a volunteer. Because, yes, they do seed occasionally. And this is growing from below the wall, growing up the wall, and into the containers that are planted above the wall. I have to mention, there's a lot of annuals in those containers because yes, the birds, bees, and butterflies, but particularly the hummingbirds. I can sit on my front porch and watch those hummingbirds and it gives me a lot of pleasure. There is a little red dangly flower there that is Fuchsia Gartenmeister. And they love that flower. Not necessarily loved by the hummingbirds, but complementing all of the rest is, again, a variegated annual. Don't be afraid to use variegated annuals um, in, in your garden. I know years ago, people were afraid of using variegation. I absolutely love it. So... Any plant that you look at that's going to fit into your garden nicely and it has some variegation is going to pick up color from other places. This is Dorothy Anthus, annual Dorothy Anthus, and it is a wonderful complement to everything else that's going on there. Now, now we're coming up on that Sally asked the question in the back of that border wasn't there a red flower? 
and and I suppose you could call this red. It's almost what would you say, Kelly? Kind of a magenta thing, more magenta than red. And um, I'm not going to quote a name here because there are so many different cone flowers and they will be coming in the bloom soon and you can make your selection because they're all welcome in the garden and you can see that little lime hydrangea is in bloom there in the following picture a garden plant that i just don't want to be without and that is oriental lilies this is the big trumpet lily and it gets quite tall now, if you'll come back to me for just a moment here, let's talk about lilies. Let's talk about if you have deer in your garden. These lilies are one of the first things they'll get. I have been out, I have sprayed with Bobex just last week. And if I hadn't, they'll come out and nip those. The worst is if they come up and they're two or three feet tall and the buds are forming at the top, it's so disappointing to go out and see they nip that in the bud, literally. If you use a product like Bob X, and, and there are a couple of others, and some people alternate the use of these, I have throughout the years, when you follow the directions as to how to use this, and particularly in the spring when there's new growth coming, if you spray those plants that are particularly susceptible, like the oriental lilies and the day lilies and the hosta and a number of the plants that, that's just breakfast, lunch, and dinner for them, I use this according to the duration. So that is helpful. I have in some places used some of the deer fencing, but you have to be sure that it it's something that's acceptable to you, looks wise, okay? And then going to the next one. I mentioned briefly when I was um, talking about including annuals in your garden to carry over some color. This is that new series of salvia. And it's the rockin' series, okay? We do have them now. They do get quite large. And if you deadhead, and you'll notice when they're finished blooming, if you deadhead that stem back to the first set of leaves, they'll continue to send out and bloom all through the season. And you can see that shape of that flower is one that the hummingbirds absolutely love. And in the next one, Again, this is the use of variegation and um, pick up color. You can do that sometimes instead of the yellow variegation. This is the white variegation and it's shown with Nicosiana, which blooms for a long period of time and the hummingbirds love. Behind it are a couple of different summer flocks. Now again, color pick up is the annual grass, ornamental grass, that is so attractive to use with a lot of these annuals and perennials, and it's Penicetum rubrum. At the base of that Penicetum rubrum is Perovskia, again, a perennial that is really long blooming in the garden. And then the next one, going back to this is this, these next two pictures are again from the garden here at the Fair Oaks location that is up by the road. Again, a perennial, long blooming, a little bit on the leggy side, but it, that's its beauty. It weaves itself into the other plants around it. And it is the hardy geranium roseanne. That's the little round purple flower in the center. In front of that is another perennial that is lung blooming. And it's Veronica, purple candles. Veronica, purple candles. It's a nice textural change with the hydrangea behind it. And then in the next picture, I told you about an allium that is a bulb and there are a lot of the large allium, which I love, 
This one blooms much later in the summertime, and it's Allium Millennium. But there are some new varieties. I was out walking through this morning, and, and we've gotten in two or three new varieties of this particular type of Allium. It's easy to divide. This clump actually could be lifted and, and broken into two or three other plants. And so you can increase your plantings that way. It's great. Just barely in flower is cat mint right beside it, Napita. And if you, after its first bloom, if you shear that back past the bloom, then you're going to get a second and probably a third bloom out of that. So you can extend a lot of these perennial blooming periods of time by shearing them back. Another valuable annual are the New Guinea impatiens. And now we have the sun patients. The sun patients will take the afternoon sun. The regular New Guineas are not as happy in the bright afternoon sun. But what one really needs to think about is they don't like to be bone dry. And so you don't want sopping wet because you don't want them to rot. But you need to be sure that they don't go bone dry. Now, let me tell you another fun thing about this too. They don't really like cold ground in the spring. So we are getting some wonderful temperatures right now. And the ground temperature is definitely warming up. It would be safe perhaps to plant them in a container right now, but you might want to wait a week or two before you attempt to put these into the ground. And um, I would think about that anyway, you know. In the following picture again at our Fair Oaks location, this is a planting that we've all enjoyed and I may seriously do a similar one again this year. In the background, of course, are evergreens and um, the blue atlas, the weeping blue atlas cedar is what you see back there. In front of that are the yellow, golden yellow coleus. Now the height on those can be contro controlled by pinching, but I did not pinch these and they're at least three feet tall. In front of that, are New Guinea impatience. They're not sun patients because they get full morning sun, but they don't get the hottest afternoon sun. And then in front of that is a plant that you either love or hate because it does creep around. And, and that's the Lysomachia aria, okay? Creeping Jenny. So as I said, can be a love-hate relationship with that plant, but I, I do love it. And going back to, this is just a little bit of a repeat showing when some of the grasses bloom in the late summer. And you're seeing again that hardy geranium. You're seeing the um, purple candles veronica. And you're also seeing um, the Mullenbergia grass that is not thrown up. It's beautiful, beautiful inflorescence is what it's called rather than a bloom. And, and But you are seeing in the background a grass that has already sent up its inflorescence, its bloom, so to speak. And that's Millennia. That is one of my absolute favorite grasses. It has low growing foliage and then sends up these tall, plumes, which is a great contrast for all the other things. And the motion when it's windy is lovely, but also when the sun, in, particularly in the late afternoon, when the sun comes through those plumes, it's absolutely beautiful. So what you've got in this picture is a lot of contrasts of size, but of texture of those plants too, which make things pretty interesting. Now, where there isn't a lot of color, you can always add a container if you choose. And this particular container is in the edge of a porter. It does get protection from the hottest afternoon sun. It gets 
dappled light through the afternoon, but that's acceptable. That's a lot different than blazing hot afternoon sun, which most hospitals do not like. And you can see that there's burned. Those are all planted in the ground. But in front of that is a container, and there's a lot of interesting things going on there. There's angel, purple angelonia. There's a uh, white alyssum cascading out of that. And there's a plant, a variegated plant called Plectranthus. Broelia is the white that you see. I want to make a point here with containers because containers are big for summer color. Do not ever sit a container directly on your soil. Number one, if they're containers that stay out all winter, they will absorb the moisture from the soil and are likely to crack. But if you sit it, the earthworms can also stop that hole up and you have to have excellent drainage there, okay? So either put it on pot feet put a piece of slate underneath it or some gravel to raise it up, but not on the soil. And I like to protect my deck by using plant feet or some method of holding it up off the deck. I do want to share, and I am running long on this, so I'm going to go quickly through. A planting that I started two or three years ago and in the back is striking, and it really is an accent in the garden, are the, the fancy elephant ears, as I call them, colocasia. Absolutely beautiful. And what you're not seeing is the back side of that leaf is a bronzy color. I've got enough yellow in there to do a striking contrast with the color. There's Carex, there's Coleus, those golden, uh, yellow golden Coleus. There's a color pickup with the canna leaves that you see there. And in front of that, the regular impatience. And there's a repeat, a closer, this is a closer view. This is toward the front of the bed. And you're seeing that I've added in the uh, regular uh, impatience, which are doing well in this area now. And the um, wonderful Ophiopogon is in front of that. And, and here, of the accent, again, within the garden. This happens to be hypertufa balls. And, and so it's fun to put accents for interest out in the garden. I am going quickly through this because I am running short of time. Okay, another grouping out in the garden in a sitting area. I have been blessed with a large family and we gather frequently and, and the sitting area is just beyond this. I did grow that Lysimachia uh, nimularia, the creeping Jenny, in containers. It dropped onto the ground. And so what you're seeing there is the ground to cover with it. But I really do like it. And so far, it's not been obnoxious. Color pickup with the Holictotrichon grass, which is very pretty all year turns brown in the winter, I leave it up until it begins to kind of fall apart in uh, February, and then I clean it up, okay? There's also uh, caladiums in here. Again, they don't like cold soil. We've just gotten some in. It's probably safe soon to put them into containers, but be sure your ground's warmed up a little bit before you put them in mass into your soil. A lot of different types of begonia, which love this environment. They get a lot of dappled light throughout the entire day. So all of these things will thrive in dappled light. Morning, okay, they would not like the very hottest afternoon sun. Okay, They don't want to bake on a sunny day. So these are not plants for that purpose. There are some colocasia coming along in the back. And uh, there's a yellow variegated leaf uh, on the far left, particularly, that is underused in containers. It's called Plectranthus. Okay. Next one. Okay. Top of the line pollinator plant is Lantana, which has to be treated as an annual in this area. 
but it blooms for a long period of time and is well loved as a pollinator. There are also a lot of that salvia in this area. Okay, and the next one is again showing the use of the crepe myrtle that does bloom for a long period of time in the summertime. And in front of that, again, you can see that I really do like little lime hydrangea. But you know what? There is a whole lot of new hydrangeas on the market today. And I don't know that I can recommend one over the other because they're slightly different and, and fun to have those. And you can see also the Hakonicloa, which is the grass that is there. Again, a wonderful contrast. And the little alliums that are in bloom there. The beauty of crepe myrtle in all seasons, even in the wintertime when it has no leaves. And the next one is a, it's rare to have a lot of flowering trees in the summer, but this one is Stewartia. It has a great form and it is an unusual bloom and it blooms mid-summer. Another shrub that is absolutely gorgeous is Calacanthus. Calacanthus Aphrodite is this variety. There are a number of different varieties there. In the next picture, you can see I love doing arrangements. I love bringing those flowers in. And there are a lot of flowers that you can, can do from plants or you can do from seed. These are primarily zinnias. I like to buy a few plants that, to start and get a, a head start with zinnias. And then I like to seed zinnia seed directly into the ground because they are well loved as pollinator plants and beautiful to bring inside and use in arrangements. They last for a very long time. Okay. You know that I'm always promoting teaching the young. And most of you have met Clara. Clara is harvesting the raspberries from her other great grandmother's garden. So when they get to taste the fruits of their labor, it's very meaningful to them. Having these children succeed at what they do, never mind that the rest of us need to succeed at what we do also, is a wonderful thing. So don't give a small child a teeny tiny pot because they can't take care of it. They can't keep it watered properly. Go ahead and take them out into the garden and let them help you work with a larger container or work in the vegetable garden, and which is what we're going to do with some planting uh, this week with Clara and her little sister Lydia too. So teach the young. Again, they are our future. All right, Miss Sally, I really ran through that very quickly. I hope that it wasn't too quick and we will have time for just a few questions. Yes. Um, all right, everybody, just start sending in your questions. If you don't mind sending them to Q&A, um, I've got a couple of questions that have come in by chat. It's just a little bit more difficult for me to track those. So if you hit the Q&A button, that would be great. Um, our first question, Peg, is back to the second slide. Um, this person says, I would love to know the names of the trees and bushes in your second picture that you said were good for using for privacy. I need privacy in one side of my garden. Well, do you know we, which trees were there? On those particular ones, I took that picture a long, long time ago, and I can't really get into there and see exactly what they are. I do know that the variegated leaf that's there is a dogwood. So I, I can certainly say even those plants that lose their leaves become a privacy thing because they're in leaf usually when you're really out in the garden, maybe not in the wintertime, but any of the small trees and then depending upon whether you have deer issues or not, there are evergreen 
arborvitaes, some that get rather large. It might be too big for a small space uh, that's deer resistant, but unfortunately the deer do like arborvitae except for the green giant. Um, but there are other holly that they're less likely to eat. You can do a mix of that sort of thing and then plant in front of it. But the best thing is to come in and say, I want a border like this. Please show me the plants that is going to deliver that for me. Okay. And and I do love the flowering plants, whether it's fringe tree or the dogwood. And the beauty of the dogwood is you can have, if you've got the space, more than one variety that may bloom at a different time. Okay. Because they do that. Some of the varieties come early, some mid and some late. So you could get a lot out of that. But there's a lot of the flowering trees or even that stewardia that I showed you the picture of that blooms in the summertime is a great one too. And those can be mixed with, if you need them to grow a little taller, some of the um, holly that are less likely to be eaten. I'm never going to say that anything is totally free of being munched on by a deer, but uh, some are less likely than others, at least, you know. Okay. So I apologize for not quoting exactly which trees those are because I it's difficult for me from this picture to recognize that. That's fine. There's so many options to choose from anyways. Um, what, okay, Do, can you pinch off the Joe Pye weed to make it branch out? Absolutely, you can. When that Joe Pye weed gets established up at probably a foot and a half, you simply pinch the top. I don't know if I got anything here that's really open to that. Okay, let's say that this is a Joe Pye weed. You want to just go in and pinch out the tippy top, okay? Then it's going to send out shoots from the side, and it'll be shorter but those shoots will still have time to bloom. Some of them may bloom a little later. Now, one of the nice things about this is, if you don't mind some height, you can pinch half and not pinch half. And so you'll get earlier bloom out of the ones you didn't pinch, and then a later flush with the other. So that there's a lot of things you can do with your plants. And okay. that's one you can certainly do that with. Yes. Um, all righty, next question. Uh, okay, this person has trouble growing butterfly weed and they want to know what kind of cultivar you're growing. That is Asclepius tuberosa. It's important to remember the tuberosa part of that. Yeah. Because that is the variety that I showed you. It needs some sunshine. Now, you saw the picture of the one that probably only gets five or six hours of direct sun, but it's afternoon sun, which is a hotter sun, okay? But it also needs good drainage. So uh, don't plant it in an area that stays wet. Now, please pay attention to winter moisture in your garden. A lot of people don't think about that because they're not out in the garden so much, maybe. But any place that holds water for a period of time in the garden might rot the root systems of things like Asclepius tuber tuberosa. Now, let's back off. I don't want you to misunderstand that some of those tall Asclepius like some moisture, but tuberosa does not, okay? Sounds good. Yeah, I was thinking, I think we have a swamp milkweed here that's- Yes, and we have swamp milkweed here that loves the moisture. Yeah, yeah. Here it's very different. It's tall and thin and has the blossoms way up here. So it's totally different plant. Loved by the monarchs, okay? Both varieties. But I prefer the other one. But drainage is important. Gotcha. Okay. Next question. How do you plant for spacing and weed prevention? Do you mulch in all of your beds? Yes, I do mulch, okay? How to weed prevention. You're going to have some weeds, okay? Because they're going to blow in whether you mulch or not. But I like to plant pretty densely 
whenever possible um, to help keep down those weeds. One thing that I can say, in shade gardens, not as prolific as weeds are in a sunny garden. So there are some advantages, even though you can't grow the things that like full sun or like a, a minimum of six hours of full sun. It's very pleasant to work out in a shade garden. It's cooler and there aren't as many weeds, okay? But planting closely is important. Now, to keep down weeds when you first are planting and that plant isn't large enough perhaps to cover that ground really well, I have used some newspaper. Now you can't do this over bulbs, okay? If you've got bulbs in there, you can't put newspaper over the bulbs. But you can put some around it and then in between these plants if you're freshly planting especially and then mulch on top of that and that will certainly help to keep the weeds down now at some point they're going to blow in okay and you're going to have to weed and then remulch okay yeah and unfortunately weeding is part of the game you know but i do find where i'm growing things densely there's fewer weeds okay all right uh, all right, I, I don't know for sure, but either a bunny or a deer ate my tulips. I think probably a bunny. Is there anything I can do? To, is, do you have any recommendations? I know Bobex for deer. Do you have any recommendations for rabbits? Bobex makes makes one that's also specific for just for deer and rabbits. Okay. Uh, but I strongly suspect if you have deer, it was probably the deer. You know. Yeah, deer love they eat tulips, don't they? Um, like they, they love the thought, they love the foliage, they love yeah. the blossoms, they love everything about the tulip. Yeah. <laughs> oh gosh. All right. Um, do you have any recommendations? Okay, I am gonna say something quick. We just got a question about deer resistant plants. Um, we have a whole class on that, so I'm just gonna let everybody know we have several recorded classes by one of our uh plant specialists who specializes in deer resistant gardening. So if we have time you might have some recommendations for that, but I, anybody who wants to get in depth on deer resistance, email me, I'll send out my email to the group and we can send you a whole class on that topic. I think um, we also have handouts too, perhaps. Yes, we have handouts at our store. Right. Um, I might be able to email, oh, I have to see what we have on file, but um, definitely yeah. contact us because we have all kinds of resources on that. Uh, it's just, we can spend hours on that. Um, Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> A lot question. of information online too from that, although I'm always hesitant to say go online because sometimes you can get some information <laughs> that's not all there, but I think you would trust some of the deer resistance. I hope so anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Next question is, I would love to know, okay, what plants would you recommend growing on a hill that is prone to erosion? Well, I actually showed you some that were there because that was a hill. It was in the sun and I turned it into a bird bee and butterfly garden. However, that may not be your thing, okay? Depending upon how much sun or shade or whatever it gets and what do you want out of that hill. Um, there are many beautiful shrubs that will do. And tell you what, I've got a new favorite shrub. I am a big fan of spirea. Spirea as a shrub in the garden blooms beautifully. And if you shear it back a bit, just a couple of inches below the bloom, it'll often rebloom a uh, little later in the season. But this is, is a plant that was produced by proven winners. And it it's double play candy corn or whatever. But this is the color of this plant throughout the season. It loses its leaves in the wintertime, but it is a beautiful plant. I've got one that's been in three or four years now, and it's probably uh, two and a half, three feet tall, and is very open and airy, and it's absolutely delightful. Now, they also have one that is a wonderful contrast to that. And I just, I don't have this one. I have not grown this one. But isn't it a beautiful contrast? 
<laughs> Let me see what the name of this is. Well, it's one of the double play. This is double play candy corn. This one's called double play doozy. I'm not sure who named that. It's a doozy, all right. D O O Z I E. But are these spireas? Isn't sorry. that beautiful? Yeah. Are those spireas? Spirea. Okay. I'm gonna. I'm sending out the spelling to everybody. So that would be, you know, those uh, low growing. Um, if it's a sunny location, low growing junipers are beautiful, but oh my, there's a lot of things that, that are lovely there, okay? Great, all right, we have one last question, so we'll go ahead and wrap up with this one. With our seasons warming earlier, do you have any recommend, oh, do you have any recommendations for this year on when we can start planting our summer flower seeds and tubers like zinnia and dahlia? What are you starting to plant your summer stuff, Peg? Okay. Confusion reigns right now, okay? Because it has been abnormally warm for several weeks, really. Um, the, one of the beauties of that is that our early flowering trees that can sometimes get frosted, like the tulip magnolias and uh, a number of that kind of thing, uh, my hydrangeas, are doing beautifully and a lot of those trees bloom for a much longer period of time because it was cool and yet it wasn't freezing. I have planted a lot of those things that I know that will take some cold and light frost already and I am going to plant some in my containers that that aren't cold hardy necessarily because the next week the temperatures look pretty good. Here is something that I keep on hand, and I am going to go ahead and plant a few things in my vegetable gardens even. I wouldn't dare put a tomato into the ground normally the second week of April, but I'm going to do that because I'm going to use, because soil temperature is important, I'm going to use this harvest guard. This is a thin fabric that air and light and water pass through. So when I plant those things, and this is a trial for me, okay? When I plant those things, I'm going to, to put a cover over of this, okay? Stapling it down with, they look like hairpins, they're called sod pins, and we do sell them here. But I'm going to leave some growing room for those tomatoes, and then, I could go ahead and put the cages over it and put it around with that also. So that would work. But this harvest guard or frost cloth is worth its weight in gold. Because if you get a surprise and all of a sudden next week, for some reason or other, we're going to get some really cold weather, you can cover them with things like this and they should be okay. Alrighty. Because normally we don't get severe frosts at this time of the year. So I'm going to take that chance, and some people will take that chance. I'm not saying go do it, but it's not a bad idea, okay? All righty, thank you. All right, that was our last question, and we're a couple minutes over, so we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Peg, thank you so much. Everybody, thank you. Just a quick reminder, you will receive an email tomorrow with your coupon, your plant notes, um, and a link to view the webinar, uh, which will be on our YouTube channel. So you'll get all of that tomorrow. If you have any questions, please feel free to follow up with me. I can connect you with Peg. And Peg, do you have anything that you would like to wrap up with? Well, if you're going out into the garden now and you do have deer running through mosquitoes and ticks, which I do have to deal with, I use a product called DEET. But I don't put this on my skin. I wear, when I'm gardening, I wear long pants and I wear a hat. And so I spray that hat and I spray those long pants. I spray my clothes. And because ticks are not funny, you don't want an issue with those. So that is very important to my gardening, okay? And I hope I didn't throw too many pictures at you at one time. Um, but a picture's worth a thousand words for me. Thank you for watching. Thank you. Have a great afternoon.